I was wondering, we had 250 people signed up, but I don't know how many would get here through the snow, so now I know the brave and the courageous ones who did. Thank you. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here. Um, this is, uh, this is going to be, you're going to see three different things today, and, uh, and we have a chance to showcase our very best talent uh, here at CSIS. I'm very proud of, of the people that we have here now. Uh, Andrew Hunter is going to begin with his look at uh, defense acquisition trends. Uh, this is a, going to be an annual publication, but this is something that that this will be the first. I think you'll find it quite interesting. All of these materials, by the way, are going to, are available electronically, and you can find them on this new website that we'll be demonstrating today as well. Uh, and then, and then uh, Todd is going to go through the uh, basically defense outlook, which is a look at the bow wave. I mean, I think that we got a lot of people talking right now. Not many people are thinking. And uh, if you look at what's forecast by the various candidates, at so, some point they're going to have to sober up and look at the data. And, uh, and this is, I think, we'll, we'll have a chance to take a look at that today. And, uh, and then Kath is going to be leading a discussion along with Mark Kansian about this new website, this uh, um, Defense 360, that uh, you'll find a lot of the work that we're currently doing on uh, Goldwater Nichols reform is posted there, and it'll be the place where we are going to provide this material on an ongoing basis for your, for your use. Um, just one word before I turn to Andrew. We, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, when we have outside events, we always start with a little safety announcement. I think Kath is going to be the responsible safety officer, so if something happens, please follow her instructions. The exits are right back here, and at that end, right behind this door is the stairway that takes us down to the to the uh, uh, this alley that's running out here. If the problem is out in the front, we're going to go to the back, and we'll meet over at National Geographic. Uh, if the problem's in the back, we're going to go out front, go down to St. Matthews, and we'll take a nose count there. So just so everybody knows what the ground rules are, nothing's going to happen. But I just want you all to be prepared and to follow Kath. So, Andrew, let me get you up here, and let's get this started for real. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you, John. So as uh, Dr. Hamry mentioned, uh, the series of reports that we're releasing today, the first that we're going to talk about is called uh, Defense Acquisition Trends 2015, Acquisition in the Era of Budgetary Constraints. Uh, CSIS has in the past done a report uh, most years on defense contract trends. Uh, what we've done with this is expand the scope to look beyond just what's happening in the numbers of the contract database but how those numbers relate to the big policy issues and acquisition that have been under discussion throughout the year. Uh, and as the, uh, the year uh, indicates, 2015, the data here is data that was available last year, um, which when it comes to contract data means that it basically runs up through the end of fiscal year 2014 is, is the data that we have available. But there are clear trends uh, that uh, persist throughout the period leading up to the end of fiscal year 2014 um, that give us a glimpse about what has been happening and some indications about what's to come. Next. So. I want to start with the big picture, and the big picture is uh, a huge drawdown in uh, contract obligation spending uh, for defense. And what we have here on this chart is a comparison between uh, contract obligations going out to industry and then total Department of Defense obligations. So this is a chart probably uh, none of us has seen before, uh, other than myself, who worked on the report, um, because the, the actual total obligation numbers for the DOD are something that most people don't look at very closely. You tend to look more closely at the budget. Uh, and then how that budget actually spends out over time, uh, people look at kind of monthly outlay data, but we often don't look at an apples to apples comparison, which is contract obligations compared to all obligations. And interestingly enough, what you see is that uh, even though the budget peaked in the 2010 timeframe, uh, contract obligations uh, persisted fairly steady, excuse me, total DOD obligations persisted fairly steady for a couple of additional years. And that's because uh, budgeted money spends out over time. It doesn't all spend at once. And so as the budget comes down, starts to come down, 
uh, obligations come down more slowly because prior year budgets start to get spent. The big exception is 2013 because that's when sequestration happened. And in fact, prior year obligations paid a large portion of that initial sequestration bill. So you see a dramatic drop in 2013 in total DOD obligations. Uh, but money for industry had been dropping for a number of years. And in fact, uh, the peak year was 2009 for, um, uh, for contract obligations. And it has been in steady decline ever since. Uh, and as we say in our report, with an accelerating decline beginning in 2013 with with the imposition of sequestration and continuing in 2014 with the budget caps. Uh, interestingly enough, though, there's every reason to believe that 2015 is, eff is effectively an inflection point, uh, that this steady, steady decline over a five-year period, uh, probably extending into a sixth year, 2015, when that data comes out, uh, will probably bottom out in 2015. And that, that's a very important fact uh, for the system and for industry. Uh, and because, as I noted, total DOD obligations have declined more slowly than contract obligations, contract obligations are a decreasing share of all the money that the department spends. And that is something that uh, we believe is likely to persist in coming years uh, because of the internal costs of the department, if you will, uh, that are going to continue to take a larger share of the budget than they did in the earlier period. Let me talk a little bit, uh, so we focus quite a bit in the report on R&D because with the emphasis on innovation, uh, R&D we felt like was really the story uh, or was a story that we wanted to look into more deeply in this year's review. And what you see is that R&D has declined the most dramatically of all the components uh, of contract obligations for the Department of Defense. Uh, the total decline, which a number I did not give you, but was 31%, the total decline for DOD comp contract obligations from 2009 to 2014 was 31%. Uh, the decline for R&D was 43%. Uh, so almost a uh, order of magnitude, uh, bigger decline for R&D. Uh, the products fell exactly in line with the overall reduction, 31%. And services uh, was proved surprisingly resilient during the drawdown, notwithstanding the fact that there's been a lot of rhetoric suggesting that uh, spending on contract services was going to be targeted that this was something that Congress wanted to see cut, that it was something that the department to some extent indicated it was taking a hard look at and wanted to cut. Uh, of the major three components of contract spending, services has been the most resilient. Uh, and R&D has really borne the brunt uh, of the drawdown in contract obligations. And we'll get into a little more uh, detail on why in our next chart. Uh, there was a lot of concern when we, uh, when people started to focus on the fact that the budget was coming down, which somewhat coincided with uh, 2012 and then more dramatically in 2013 with sequestration, uh, that, that this was going to cause the department to consume its seed corn because in some ways this seemed like the easiest thing to cut. Uh, it doesn't have a constituency. It's not a spread across thousands of congressional districts. Uh, it doesn't generate something that you can put your hands on in the near term. Basic research in some ways is, uh, was thought potentially to be much more vulnerable because it doesn't have as much uh, or didn't seem to have a, as much of a political constituency as some of the other components of spending. Um, but in fact, uh, and it, or I should say, and in fact, uh, basic research uh, and the next level up applied research uh, have gone down, but compared to other parts of R&D, uh, they've done relatively well. Again, the overall decline in R&D contract obligations was 43%. Um, basic research fell uh, over that 2009 to 2014 period by 32%. Applied research, only 15%. So taking those two together, it's in the 20s, uh, about half of the overall rate of decline for R&D spending. Uh, what did come down, uh, almost staggeringly in my mind, is the uh, spending for System uh, Development and Demonstration, SDD, which is where, in most cases, your big weapon systems, the spending to develop those and get those ready for production and do the design work, is that's where that spending lies. That fell 66% over the, over the five-year period. And uh, essentially, we have uh, called this or described this as a five-year trough in the pipeline for major weapon systems. Over that five-year period, a decline of 66%, uh, a combination of systems that, that failed, 
Uh, and the classic example of that would be Future Combat System, which at the start of this period still had about two and a half billion dollars uh, of obligations under, its, uh, under that program, uh, but by the end of the period was non-existent. Um, you've had some programs beginning to mature out of system design and development and into production. An example of that would be F-35, which is now you know, approaching uh, pretty significant production rates, and the SDD program is, is completing. It's not over yet, and it won't fully end because there's multiple blocks of F-35 that have to be designed and developed. Um, but it has certainly come down. Um, but F-35 is only about 10 percent of the reduction in SDD. Uh, so what you see is a just uh, a huge trough that has developed in the pipeline for major weapon systems. And that has big implications, obviously, for the future of the department's modernization and has big implications for industry and particularly for the big industry players who are the prime actors in that space. And you can see that on the next chart, which uh, shows the share of funding by vendor size of the R&D uh, R&D contracts. Uh, and you see that the top, the, the line I'll ask you to focus on is the top line, which is purple, which is the big five uh, contractors. And you see that since 2009 and starting actually a little bit prior, uh, that their share of total R&D contracts has fallen substantially, over 10 percent. And that is an indication or that is an effect of that five-year trough uh, in the major, major weapon systems pipeline. And let me shift gears a little bit and talk about something else that, that uh, experienced a transition in 2015. Because again, this year's report looks beyond just contract data towards bigger policy trends and, and shifts that we see happening. And the big shift that happened in acquisition policy in 2015 was a shift from the original better buying power emphasis, which is all about productivity and efficiency, uh, towards what was emphasized in better buying power 3.0, which is uh, innovation. Technical, uh, technical dominance on the battlefield. And so uh, that focus of the department and its attempts to change uh, the acquisition system uh, happened with Better Buying Power 3.0. Uh, and in the Congress, you also begin to see a shift. Uh, certainly not to say that Congress isn't still concerned greatly about cost growth and isn't concerned about efficiency, but you see in the 2016 NDAA which is the most extensive set of statutory changes that we've seen since the 1990s in 20 years, uh, a focus also on innovation and trying to accelerate the adoption of new technologies. Uh, and there was a range of provisions done here, uh, consolidating authority and, oh, by the way, accountability uh, for acquisition with uh, military services, uh, expanding and, and tasking the department to create new mechanisms, new processes to bring uh, technologies to bear in a, you know, a five-year, two to five-year time frame instead of a 20 to 30-year time frame, uh, streamlining of documentations and approvals, and significant simplification towards uh, the ability to access commercial technologies and non-developmental technologies. Uh, and then lastly, it's important to note uh, that a lot of progress was made in 2015 in the department trying to come up with long-term approaches to how to leverage technology in new ways uh, to support the war fight, uh, which uh, we've sort of captured with the term the department uh, tends to use, third offset strategy. Uh, that's kind of a complicated term and hard to describe exactly what it means and why it's used. Uh, but in essence, it captures the idea of how to use innovation uh, to enable the future war fight with new capabilities. And then one... Uh, Two last points about industry before I turn to, to take some questions on the acquisition trends report, and then we'll transition to, to Todd's report with the second of our three. Uh, in terms of industry, um, there's been a lot of stability in the structure of industry, even as there's been a drawdown, which is a major difference of this drawdown compared to the drawdown of the 1990s, the, the infamous Last Supper uh, drawdown. Uh, but you see right at the tail end some interesting things, excuse me, the right slide up. Some interesting things starting to happen. Uh, you see that uh, small businesses really jump up dramatically in 2014. Uh, and, and you also see that, uh, you know, big five contractors uh, took a step down in 2014, uh, although they 
over the period, they didn't do too badly, which reflects the fact that in addition to the trough and the major weapon systems pipeline, those big companies are also doing a lot of sustainment work, a lot of services work, uh, and, and work overseas. So overall, they managed to keep their share of the total defense market fairly constant until 2014. Uh, and they really took a hit from sequestration and in the initial uh, years under the, the lower level budget caps. But as I mentioned, 2015 is probably the last year in which uh, contract obligations are likely to go down. It's possible you'll see a modest dip. 2016 could come in ever so slightly lower because of some of the time lags in acquisition. Um, but really, if you will, the end of the drawdown is now in sight, thanks to the balanced budget agreement of 2015. Uh, and uh, an industry in 2015 started to respond to the fact that there's a new environment coming, even if we may not quite be there yet. Uh, in terms of contract obligations. And so you start to see a real spike in mergers and acquisition activities in industry. Uh, you see that Excellus was acquired by Harris Corporation, ATK and Orbital merged. These are multi-billion dollar uh, transactions. Uh, CSC Government Services and SRA International uh, merged to form CSRA, so a, a pretty uh, dramatic growth of a major services focused uh, prime contractor. Uh, and obviously the, the uh, sale of the Sikorsky business unit by United Technologies to Lockheed Martin. Uh, all of these uh, strike, uh, strike us as examples of industry posturing and getting ready to uh, prepare for that next phase in the acquisition cycle, uh, which will be one of growth, albeit very slow growth, uh, most likely. Uh, the Department of Defense is very interested in and to, has some concerns, maybe see some opportunities in the work and you know, the efforts going on in industry to prepare for this. And so they're keeping a close eye on this mergers and acquisition activity and may uh, are expected to propose uh, legislation relating to that uh, coming for the next year, uh, which may have some tough sledding in Congress. Uh, but you start to see that um, everyone's getting ready for the next phase. And then let me just uh, briefly talk about the fact, since acquisition uh, contracts come from the services, the, these uh, programs and contracts are implemented not by the Department of Defense as a whole, but by the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, and Air Force, uh, you see differences definitely between the services. And the biggest one of note effectively is the Army. Uh, you see that uh, Acquisition for the Army over the five-year period, 2009 to 2014, declined 52%. Uh, so a very dramatic decline. Some of that, obviously, is the drawdown from the war, uh, which is not small, uh, but it is, it is bigger than that. And as I mentioned earlier, the disappearance of FCS, which has not been replaced in effect by anything, really, uh, that corresponds to it, is a huge uh, gap in the Army acquisition portfolio. Uh, the Navy is actually fairly stable. Its acquisition declined 19% over the period, much less than the overall budget drawdown. Uh, and the Air Force is sort of an in-between case uh, at a 24% reduction. So with that, I'm going to open up to some questions on the acquisition trends portion of the report, if there are any. And, uh, and then after a few minutes, then we'll turn over to Todd, who's going to talk about the bow wave. I'm so loud, though. Uh, Sidney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. You mentioned third offset, which is like catnip to me. Uh, <laughs> how much does the very ambitious but very vague third offset strategy depend on some of these acquisition reforms going through that actually streamline the system so you can get innovative technologies faster? How much does it depend on the health of these companies you've been talking about in the traditional industrial base? And how much does it depend on access to non-traditional firms, which again probably requires looping back acquisition reform so they'll be willing to do business with this huge bureaucracy that is DOD? Well, I think that was actually at least three questions, but uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me try and run through those quickly. Uh, I would say it is, it is dependent on change. It's not necessarily dependent on massive change to the laws. The department has demonstrated uh, over the course of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that it is possible to move quickly uh, using the tools that exist in statute 
today. It is possible to do that. It does, however, require special effort, special uh, senior leadership support. It does require thinking differently uh, about the way that programs are approached. And so there does need to be change in the way to think about uh, acquisition and to approach it, uh, not necessarily massive changes to laws, but a, a difference of approach, which is where I believe you know, the Better Buying Power 3.0 can have, can have a big impact. And also uh, the provisions that were adopted in the 2006 NDAA, which tasked the department to create a new path uh, to enable much faster timelines in deploying technology also can, can potentially have a very big impact if implemented in a way that uh, has consensus support and that accomplishes that. So that's a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, second piece of your question was um, essentially how do you leverage the industry and the big industry players to get innovation? Uh, uh, I think the, the, the traditional primes uh, have an important role to play in third offset and in bringing those uh, capabilities to the table. I think as you'll see, uh, you know, a little bit from our acquisition trends report and certainly from, from Todd's report, uh, you know, there is a lot of stuff already in the pipeline. And for third offset to be effective, uh, those existing platforms, those existing systems, and also the systems that are already far along in development uh, are going to have to adopt third offset technologies and approaches. And so you're going to have to be able to work with those traditional primes to incorporate those approaches into the infrastructure of what's already out there and already on the, uh, on the plans. One interesting thing I'll note in particular about the Army, uh, sometimes I despair about the Army because the, the fall off and modernization spending has been so extreme, but it's also, I think, true to say that there's some opportunity there uh, because what's on the drawing board is mostly in the range of upgrades um, and, and not as much of that as you might like. Uh, you know, there is an opportunity to build a program there that is not all, you know, not all committed uh, to some, some grand vision that is not a vision that meshes with the third offset strategy. Uh, and then the last part of your question was about the new players. Um, uh, I think, again, a lot of the tools for reaching out to and accessing those new players exist, uh, and particularly with the expansions of other transaction authority in this year's defense authorization bill and authority for treating non-developmental uh, items as commercial items. I think those are two key uh, aspects that were done in 2016 that can help. Uh, but again, it's a mindset. That you, you, to approach those players requires a different mindset from the traditional mindset of the department. Parts of DOD are very good at that. Other parts are not. And so the key will be the mindset and the people and the system being able to change their approach. And I think we have time for another question. So other questions? Here. Uh, my name is Hank Gaffney, a uh, long time in defense. The, um, the tone of what you're saying, I was a little confused. Uh, you seem to be very optimistic things have at least leveled out, and yet we are still under sequestration. Um, it'll be a struggle each year to do something other than a level. Um, why are you so optimistic? <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'm sort of pathologically optimistic by nature, so that probably explains some of it. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because you know, one of the limitations uh, of using contract data as a data source is that there are time lags and that the data that you're looking at is old by the time you get access to it. Uh, and so you have to be able to reconcile that with what you know because of things like the balanced budget agreement, which uh, was actually pretty good news for 2016, much positive but much less so for 2017. Uh, you have to incorporate that into the, to the picture that you're seeing with the more backward-looking uh, contract data. And uh, to me, what that suggests is that because the, the procurement, the modernization budget, the procurement R&D for 2016 was significantly higher than 2015. Uh, that's why I'm reasonably confident that 2015 will be the bottom of the cycle. It certainly will from a budget perspective. I suspect it will be for the contract perspective, but it's possible there, there could be a little bit of a lag there. Uh, the big question, I think, is then what happens next? Do we sort of hit the bottom of the trough and stick there, uh, or does it start to grow? 
Uh, I am uh, sort of modestly optimistic to, depending on your perspective um, and what your desires are for defense, it could be considered pessimistic in the sense that I see very, very, very slow rates of growth for acquisition starting in 2017 and going forward. Uh, 2017, depending on how the budget cycle plays out, will probably be at best modestly higher for modernization spending than, than 2016. Um, but there's a feature of the sequestration budget caps that we are getting to now that has not been true in the past, which is the levels in the BCA, uh, and I get lectured by Todd when I say sequestration caps because sequestration is a mechanism, the caps are the caps. But what I mean by that is the original budget agreement had two sets of caps in it. It had a set of caps if the super committee succeeded, and it had a set of lower caps if the super committee failed. And we're at those lower caps because the super committee failed. So uh, that's what I mean when I say sequestration caps. I just mean those lower level of caps. Those lower level of caps actually, we've reached the point now where the budget has come down enough that those lower caps actually start to be either a, a steady state or even over time an increase, as, as will be more clear uh, when you see some of Todd's analysis. So uh, I would say even if we do really poorly as a nation and we don't correct the failures of the, of the original Budget Control Act, even under that scenario, um, you start to see modest potential rates of growth in contract obligations. Uh, my hope is and my belief is we'll do better than that, and that's really the, the source of the optimism. I think time for one more question on acquisition trends. Uh, here. Bill Sweetman, Aviation Week. Um, coming back to the Army, um, doesn't it look more like the, the issue has been there was no FCS and the Army hasn't simply, simply hasn't decided what to do about its vehicles? I mean, it's roadcraft modern modernization, which is quite high budget, and its UAV acquisitions have been in good shape. Um, and doesn't that also suggest that when the Army does decide what its next armored vehicle, combat vehicle, is going to look like, there's going to be a push to um, start putting some of that money back, and that's going to be a further stress on acquisition? Well, I think you're essentially right. Uh, when the Army uh, uh, develops a concept, a vision, an approach, and a, con maybe consensus is too strong a word, but a uh, a general institutional push towards th kind of the next thing, uh, the next big idea for Army modernization, where they think they're going to get significant warfighting capability increase through a big technology push, uh, uh, that will change the picture. Uh, that's what we're sort of looking for, if you want to put it that way. I, I did, by the way, take, I've been uh, following with interest the confirmation hearing for Eric Fanning, where he uh, made allusion to uh, this issue as clearly focused on it. General Milley is also focused on it. Uh, it's clear they don't have an answer yet, but there were several studies tasked to the Army Science Board uh, to really explore this in depth. So I think, you know, the seeds are there. Uh, and as I've said, I think the opportunity is there uh, for a push towards the next, the next big vision for the Army. Uh, but you're right. It's the collapse of future combat system and the fact that there has been nothing essentially to replace it and, it, and it died a slow death because it sort of morphed into the ground combat vehicle, which also died, uh, and several other systems. It'll be interesting when that does happen, you know, if you go into the Wayback Machine, uh, the Army had a plethora of small modernization programs prior to FCS, all of which were either killed or sort of consolidated and rolled up into FCS, which is one reason why it was so damaging when FCS failed. Um, and you could see something similar when this next you know, when the worm turns and the next uh, approach begins, that what is now sort of a plethora of diffuse and somewhat unconnected upgrade and modernization programs could all be gathered back up into a larger, a larger push. And for, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd, who's going to take you into more of a forecast look for where acquisition is heading. Thank you, Andrew. And, and so I'll pick up where Andrew is leaving off. Andrew was looking at what's happened uh, in terms of acquisitions and contracts and how we got to where we are today. Uh, and my study uh, is looking at uh, the modernization bow wave. So where are we supposed to be headed? What challenges remain uh, over the next 15 years? 
Um, so I'll start with the phrase modernization bow wave. Most people, I think, in this community are familiar with it. You hear people talking about the modernization bow wave all the time. What does it really mean? Uh, we're talking about uh, the future acquisition plans, and they tend to look like a bow wave uh, because they keep getting pushed further and further into the future, uh, projecting a significant increase of funding will come, usually just outside the five-year projection in DOD's budget. Uh, it tends to be a very optimistic way of planning your programs. Uh, and a modernization bow wave typically forms uh, when the overall defense budget is declining and various acquisition programs have to be delayed or they get stretched out over time and you just keep pushing the funding requirements just outside your, your five-year planning horizon. Now, I think the bow wave metaphor is appropriate uh, because much like a bow wave in front of a ship, if you're pushing too large of a modernization bow wave, it starts to become a real drag on your modernization programs, and it leads to bad uh, decision making, uh, and ultimately it can reduce your defense uh, buying power in the future. But unlike a, a bow wave in front of a ship, so this is where the metaphor fails here, uh, you can't just keep pushing this wave out in the future indefinitely. Uh, the weapon systems that you have eventually have to be replaced, or they have to be upgraded, modernized, something. Uh, or else you will have to retire them. Uh, you can't keep sailing ships or subs or flying planes or driving tanks forever. Uh, and if you don't replace them, just modernizing the systems that you do have uh, can be quite an expense, prohibitively expensive in some cases. Uh, so the study that I'm going to present to you now, uh, I focused on the major acquisition programs, 120 major acquisition programs that are either already in progress or are planned to be started in the next 15 years. Uh, I am not including operation and sustainment cost. I am just focusing, focusing on the acquisition cost here. Uh, and of course, not including black programs. These are programs that we don't know about uh, in public. Uh, space, so we really can't analyze those. Uh, my, I used a variety of data sources. Uh, the main thing I will point out to you that this is all a snapshot in time as of the PB16 budget release. Of course, we don't have the PB17 budget yet, um, so this will give you, uh, this is basically a stage setter for what you should look for when the budget, uh, the PB17 budget does come out on February 9th. Uh, what are the big issues you should be tracking? All right. So uh, a little retrospect here, uh, looking back on acquisition, the acquisition budget, uh, going back to the previous peak, fiscal year 85 in the Reagan administration, uh, that's when the acquisition budget previously peaked. Uh, but you can see this time around uh, in uh, FY08, I believe, uh, the acquisition budget actually peaked in inflation-adjusted dollars at a slightly higher level than at the Reagan peak. Now. A good portion of that was due uh, to war-related funding. Uh, so what was being procured uh, in this war-related funding? It was things like the MRAP uh, vehicles, things like Predator and Reaper UAVs, uh, the C-27J uh, cargo aircraft. Anyone remember that? You may not remember it because we bought it and then we retired it. Um, then you look at the base budget, though, and the base budget actually grew quite a bit as well. Base budget for acquisition funding at its peak actually got within 20% of the peak at the Reagan buildup. Uh, so what happened? Why haven't we already modernized? Why haven't we already been through the modernization bow wave? Well, a lot of things happen, uh, and it's, it's, there are a lot of reasons uh, to explain this. I'll go into a few of them quickly. Part of it is we were buying much more expensive, much more complex systems uh, during this time. So if you look at our inventory of equipment today, even though we did have this wave of acquisition funding in the 2000s, in the base budget and in the war budget, we don't have a lot to show for it. Uh, that's because programs are much more expensive. We're not able to replace systems on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, but also, a number of the things that we bought uh, during the uh, previous peak here, uh, we've already retired. Um, and another more disturbing trend from the 2000s were the number of canceled programs. And here I'm just looking at uh, 18 programs I was able to identify, major programs, that were canceled during the 2000s while they were still in development. Now, there are many other programs uh, that were terminated uh, early, but we did buy some systems, so we have something to show for it. These are programs where we have no fielded systems to show for it. 
Of these 18 programs that I identified, it's not a comprehensive list by any means, uh, it totals $59 billion in sunk costs. $59 billion we spent, and we don't have modernized weapons to show for it. Uh, also, interestingly, when I was doing this, I looked at of these 18 programs, I found at least five of them. Uh, we canceled, uh, and then we started a follow-on program to supersede it, and then we also canceled the follow-on program. Um, so uh, it's very interesting stories on some of these. Uh, it goes into more detail in the report, uh, but I will push ahead uh, for the sake of time here. Uh, now, what's happened with the, the current modernization bow wave that we've got in front of us? Well, you could see it starting to build as soon as we came off that peak in fiscal year 2010. Um, the dash line is where the acquisition budget, total acquisition budget, uh, has actually gone over the past few years. Uh, and the solid lines that you see there are the acquisition budgets in successive uh, president's budget request. And you can see that in each budget request, our projection over the five-year planning period of what we're going to be spending on acquisitions has progressively come down. But interestingly, those projections, even though they've come down, they've still been higher than what was actually appropriated by Congress in each of these years. So Congress has been cutting as well. Now, FY16, not shown here uh, because finalized this before the appropriations were actually enacted in December. FY16 is a turnaround. FY16, Congress appropriated very close to what the administration had requested for that year. So we've seen this, the, the telltale sign of, an, of a modernization bowway starting to build is that we start uh, deferring and delaying and stretching programs, and we appear to be doing that now. Um, so do we have a bow wave? Well, here it is. Uh, this is the bow wave I was able to calculate. This is only looking at the 120 major acquisition programs that uh, I referred to earlier. Uh, there are also more than half of the acquisition budget is for smaller acquisition programs where we don't have uh, detailed data uh, and we certainly don't have long-term funding plans for the smaller acquisition programs. So in the following slides you're going to see now, I'm just focusing on the major acquisition programs. So a couple of interesting things here. Uh, you can see that there is a bow wave. It peaks in fiscal year 22. Uh, there's a 23 percent real increase from FY15 to FY22 in these major acquisition programs. So that's the bow wave that we're dealing with. But the two things I find interesting are, are one, the time sequencing of those increases. Uh, it's really in two steps, and the first step we've already taken. Uh, the first step is the increase from FY15 to FY16. That's already happened. Uh, and then you see in the PB16 FIDEP, that five-year plan, it, the acquisition funding for these programs is basically flat. The next increase comes just outside the five-year planning uh, window. It's another increase about equivalent to the increase we just had from 15 to 16. Uh, this time it's in FY21 and FY22. So that's the next big increase. So when the new budget request comes out, we'll have one more year of the planning horizon. We'll be able to see what they're planning for FY21 and we can see how they're starting to deal with the modernization bow wave. But the peak will still be just beyond that in FY22. The other interesting thing uh, that I found here is that the bow wave uh, is not evenly distributed across the services. Most of the bow wave is actually coming from the Air Force, uh, and that's a bit surprising. So I'm going to go through now uh, in more detail for each of the services. So if you look at the Air Force's bow wave for major acquisition programs, uh, there's a 73% real increase from FY15 to FY23 uh, is when the Air Force peaks um, and their planned acquisition funding for these programs. Uh, a couple things I'll point out here, uh, under nuclear forces in red, uh, that really is the uh, Minuteman replacement, GBSD, ground-based strategic deterrent. Uh, that program is projected to grow uh, significantly uh, over this 15-year planning uh, period as the program gets started. It's just in the early stages right now of getting started, uh, but that is intended to eventually replace the Minuteman three uh, ICBMs that the Air Force currently has in its inventory. Also, space systems, uh, shown here uh, in the gold color. Uh, not a big bow wave there, but there's some real uncertainty. 
Uh, what I did in the projection here was just assume that we continue uh, buying current generation satellites and evolve those over time. Uh, that's because the Air Force has not announced plans for follow-on systems for many of the constellations that they currently have. But we will have to buy replacement satellites. That's uh, unlike many other weapon systems, we don't have the technology yet to go back and upgrade the satellites on orbit and extend their lives. Uh, they usually have you know, a 10 to 15 year lifespan. Uh, they will have to be replaced uh, sooner or later. Uh, and so I just built in replacements with current generation systems with some evolutionary upgrades over time. And the cost estimate here, the Air Force may actually come out with plans to build new systems uh, to replace these, and that could be much more expensive than what's shown here. So this is a pretty conservative estimate in terms of the cost of space systems. But the real growth, the real driver within the Air Force's modernization bow wave is aircraft. And so if we look in more detail, um, here are the major aircraft, uh, Air Force aircraft programs that are planned over the next 15 years. And you can see that there are four programs that really dominate uh, this bow wave. Of course, the F-35A, the LRSB, the new bomber where the contract was just awarded. The KC-46A is the tanker replacement. Uh, and TX is the future uh, training aircraft the Air Force intends to procure. Now, I will point out to you, look at the, uh, the vertical axis on the side here, notice the scale. Uh, the Air Force's major aircraft programs, uh, funding for these programs is projected to grow from 12 billion in FY15 to 22 billion uh, by FY23 at the peak, and that's all in 2016 dollars. So almost doubling in cost uh, over uh, this time period. I say look at the scale because later I'm going to show you some bow waves in the other services, and it's the scale that is the difference. Uh, so keep, keep that in your mind. So those are the big uh, Air Force aircraft programs that are really driving our modernization bow wave. And of course, the Air Force's top three acquisition priorities that they um, have publicly stated many times are the top three programs that they have here, F-35, LRSB, and the tanker. Now, let's look at the Navy and Marine Corps. So this is Department of Navy acquisition funding. Uh, and this was a surprise to me when I did the study. This is really not a bow wave here. In fact, they're actually coming down off a bow wave uh, for some of these programs. So uh, overall, the major acquisition program funding for Navy and Marine Corps is set to decline. It'll hold steady, it bumps around a little. Uh, between now and FY22, but then it'll decline by about a third in real terms from FY22 to FY30. Now, you may be surprised like I was, what's happening here? I thought Ohio replacement uh, is a really big bill for the Navy. And, and in the graph here, Ohio replacement, I've included it under nuclear forces. And it is a big bill that's coming due for the Navy, uh, but it's being offset by some other programs that are declining over that same time period. Uh, Navy and Marine Corps major aircraft programs are set to decline precipitously uh, over the next 15 years. And that's because the Navy and Marine Corps have already upgraded many of their um, uh, aviation weapon systems over the past decade. Uh, for several years now, the Navy has been buying more aircraft than the Air Force. Uh, and so that is going to come to an end in the near future. Programs like the P-8A, uh, Poseidon, uh, will be coming to an end around FY20. Uh, programs like the V-22 for the Marine Corps, the E-2D replacement uh, for the E-2s the Navy currently has, those will all be coming to an end. Uh, now what remains here uh, that you can see at the bottom, of course, is the F-35, the B and the C model for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, that remains relatively steady over this time period. Uh, and so, you know, what we'll see is by the end of this period, by around FY30, uh, if they stick to their current plans, that uh, the vast majority of Navy and Marine Corps aircraft procurements will be uh, in just one program, the F-35 program. Okay, so let's look at the shipbuilding nuclear uh, programs for the Navy. Um, this is interesting because as Ohio replacement program ramps up, and of course it is a big program, uh, the Navy's already worked into its plan a partial offset. Every year that the Navy is planning to buy an Ohio replacement ship, they buy one less Virginia class sub. So they are already making a direct trade-off 
within subs uh, between nuclear and conventional missions. Uh, and so that is not completely offsetting the increase due to Ohio replacement, uh, but it does go quite a long way to helping offset it. Of course, the other two big shipbuilding programs over this time period are the DD DDG-51 destroyers. Uh, the shipbuilding plan long-term says it will keep buying two of those per year, and of course the Ford-class carriers uh, will keep buying those at a rate of one every five years. Uh, some of the other big programs uh, shown in here, like the DDG-1000 uh, is already coming to an end soon, uh, and the littoral combat ship uh, is programmed in here. I'll talk about that because they've already announced a change for LCS uh, that's not reflected here, but will be reflected in the PB-17 budget. All right, so if you look at the Army, the Army has a bit of a bow wave of its own. Uh, that is true, but I would refer you back to look at the scale here. Um, it's actually not that big of an increase in dollar amount, uh, even though it is a, a significant increase percentage-wise. Uh, the Army's bow wave uh, is really driven by ground systems, and ground system procurement for the Army really cratered after the crash of future combat systems that Andrew talked about earlier. Uh, let's look at that, uh, the long-term plans in more detail. Uh, the Army does have some, some big plans. There are five big programs here uh, for ground system procurement. Uh, JLTV, we've already had the contract award for that, uh, so that program is planned to ramp up over the next five-year period. But they all, the Army's also programmed in money uh, in the PB-16 request for Abrams upgrade, for AMPV, for Bradley modernization, uh, and for the, the Paladin uh, uh, modernization as well. Now, if all of those programs proceed as planned, that would be a pretty steep bow wave. But again, look at the scale here. We're talking uh, going from uh, just over a billion dollars a year uh, to about three and a half billion dollars a year. So that is, uh, that is pocket change. You can only hear this in DC. I'm talking about billions of dollars. I'm calling it pocket change. That is pocket change compared to Air Force aircraft modernization bow wave. All right. Now, it's not just ground systems for the Army. They actually are planning a pretty significant increase uh, in funding for communication systems as well. Uh, three big programs here, uh, WIN-T Increment 2 uh, that you can see here on the bottom in green, uh, the Jitters HMS, that's the handheld version of the Jitters radios uh, in gold, uh, and then just above that, uh, the AMF Jitters, they had to reverse the order of the acronym there. Uh, those are the, the Jitters radios that are installed on vehicles, aircraft, and uh, ground vehicles as well. Uh, all of those programs are project projected to ramp up significantly in the coming years as well. And then I also looked beyond uh, just the services and looked at the other defense agencies and, of course, Department of Energy uh, has the uh, uh, National Nuclear Security Agency um, they also uh, have programs to modernize uh, the inventory of uh, nuclear warheads uh, as well. So those are included because those NNSA programs count under the defense budget cap. Uh, so it is part of the trade space here and programs. Now, the big part you see here in green at the bottom, uh, ballistic missile defense systems, that's MDA funding. That is a hodgepodge of different missile defense programs. Uh, they don't provide a lot of detail and they don't provide much of a long-term estimate. Uh, but assuming we stay at basically the same level they've been at for many years now, uh, that would uh, be a significant part uh, of basically steady state funding over time. Now, obviously there are a lot of changes you could make uh, within those programs, but they aren't showing it yet. Now, on top of that, all the diff other different slivers that you see, uh, those are mainly the weapons modernization programs, nuclear weapons modernization programs. They don't have a bow wave because they have been deliberately staggered. Uh, in order to uh, stage them at different times. So as one modernization program finishes, another one starts ramping up. So NNSA has already done a pretty good job of smoothing out that bow wave. All right, so now I wanna talk about risk and alternatives. Uh, and as uh, Andrew said, he's a, a, a perpetual optimist. Uh, I'm gonna be a real pessimist here uh, because I think actually things will be worse than what I've shown you. And why is that? Well, one is we've got funding uncertainty because of the Budget Control Act. Uh, now, those post uh, the, I'm sorry, post super committee budget caps uh, that Andrew talked about earlier—that's the light pink 
uh, line there that's basically a straight line across the bottom here. We've never actually gone down to that level. Uh, why is that? Well, we've had budget deals that have come up uh, at the last minute every time that have increased the budget caps above that bottom level. Uh, and hardly anyone has been talking about going below the BCA, the original budget cap level there. Uh, and so every year we've gotten these deals um, to increase the budget caps. We've never gone all the way to the bottom. These budget deals, uh, the three deals that we've had so far, uh, have increased the budget caps by a cumulative $97 billion from FY13 to FY17. So we've got $97 billion in relief so far. But even with the most recent deal from last October, the BBA 2015 budget deal, uh, we are still set to return to these budget caps, the lower level budget caps, in FY18 to FY21. So we've got another four years where the budget caps have not yet been increased. And so the real risk here for defense is, will they get another deal? Uh, now, recent history seems to suggest that, yeah, they'll get another deal and they'll raise the budget caps closer to the president's request, uh, but recent history also suggests that we won't know that until the last minute. Uh, we may be partially into fiscal year 18 before we get another budget deal. That's what happened with the BBA 2015 deal, the BBA 2013 deal, and the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. Those all happened uh, when we were already into the fiscal year. So it's very difficult to make long-term modernization plans when you are stumbling from one budget deal to the next with a tremendous amount of uncertainty on what the deal will give you in terms of budgetary relief. So that is a big risk going forward. Another major risk is cost overruns. Uh, and if you've ever heard of defense acquisition programs, you've probably heard the term cost overrun used with them. That's because it happens quite a bit. Uh, so the funding projections that I've shown you here do not include these unanticipated cost overruns. Um, now, prior studies have uh, identified some trends in cost overruns for defense acquisitions. Uh, so a 2008 RAND study uh, found that uh, defense acquisitions had an average growth of 57% while in development and 34% in procurement. That's pretty significant cost growth, and that's averaged uh, across programs. So some grew more than that, some grew less. Uh, a separate RAND study from 2006 didn't divide it between acquisition and procurement. They just looked at the average total growth, and they came out with 46% average growth in acquisition programs. Uh, so this is not looking good, right? So you go back to that modernization bow wave, and you project in just typical cost overrun growth here, uh, and it's going to increase it significantly. Now, another study, a more recent study, 2014 from Ida, they actually found a correlation, now it's not causality, so don't go reading too much into it, but they found a correlation between the magnitude of cost growth in defense acquisitions uh, and when the program was initiated. So programs that were started in a budget downturn had a higher magnitude of cost growth, pretty significantly. Um, so what's causing this? Well. The main driver of cost overruns in acquisition programs is errors in the initial cost estimates. We're too optimistic when we set the initial cost estimate at milestone B for these programs. Uh, and so that means that programs that are in this modernization bow wave that are still early in development are the ones that are most at risk for cost overruns. So programs like LRSB, JLTV, Ohio Replacement, uh, and many others are still very early in development, uh, and so they still are at high risk of having cost overruns, and those overruns could be substantial. Some of the programs that we already have uh, in the pipeline uh, that are more mature, that are for, further along in development, they've already had significant cost overruns. SIBRS, uh, Space-Based Infrared System, has had a 212% increase from its original cost estimate. And of course, everyone's favorite, the F-35 program, has increased by 51% from its in, uh, initial milestone B cost estimate. So there may be more to come uh, in terms of modernization costs. But I would add this, that even if we have these cost overruns, it's not likely to increase the peak of the modernization bow wave. And why is that? 
when programs have cost overruns, they tend to not increase their annual funding. What they do is they tend to stretch themselves out and they'll remain at a higher level of annual funding for longer. So the, the total cost of the program in the end will go up, uh, but the annual funding requirement may not go up that much at all. So what we may see if we get into a situation where we have cost overruns on some of the major programs is that the bow wave just gets stretched out even further. And so that higher level of funding will be required for a longer period of time. Now, another uh, set of issues to be concerned about that uh, are going to be a particular challenge in this modernization bow wave uh, are the, the consolidation that we've seen in the industrial base uh, and the oversight uh, capacity of the acquisition workforce. Uh, so as Andrew touched on before, we have seen contracts uh, in the 1990s especially. We saw a lot of consolidation of contract awards going to a smaller and smaller set of companies. In the 1990s, uh, the consolidation occurred mainly by the big prime companies buying up some of the medium and larger size companies or merging with them. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, even though the budget environment was different, instead of declining, acquisition funding was going up in the 2000s, we didn't see a reverse of the consolidation and actually we, we saw a different type of consolidation. We saw more of the contract awards uh, going uh, to large companies uh, that were merging with some of the medium-sized companies. And consolidation has not been even across all sectors of the defense industrial base. Uh, aircraft, uh, the aircraft sector in particular, you've got 95% of the contract awards going to the big primes and the large primes. Uh, so a very narrow set of companies taking 95% of the awards there. Uh, so that could be an issue uh, because we simply may not have competition in all sectors. Uh, so that could lead to cost increases. Uh, and we may not have the industrial capacity anymore uh, to execute all of these programs at once. So of course, what would be required uh, is to expand the capacity of industry. Uh, that requires an investment by DOD. Now, when it comes to oversight, uh, I put this chart up here because I thought it was interesting. As we saw DOD's acquisition budget rise uh, in the 2000s, the size of the acquisition workforce overseeing all of that actually declined slightly. <laughs> uh, and then when the acquisition budget started to come down, the size of the acquisition workforce actually came up a little. And that was part of the realization that we had gone too far. Uh, in terms of outsourcing some of this core acquisition workforce uh, oversight uh, workload to the private sector. And so there has been a reverse in the trend there. Uh, but that's something to watch as well as funding for acquisitions increases. Uh, we may need to see an increase in the acquisition workforce, which would be another car cost that is largely borne outside uh, of the acquisition budget in O&M. All right, so what can we do about it? Three alternatives I outline in the study, uh, and these are not intended to be mutually exclusive. Uh, you could do some hybrid of these. Alternative one, of course, is ask for more money, right? Let's just give more money. Uh, what would be required uh, to do that? Well, they're already at, the department is already asking for more money. Uh, in the PB16 plan, they were well above uh, the budget cap level of funding. Uh, but the extra needed just outside the FIDAP, you can see here uh, in the gold line at the top, uh, they would need to bump that up 4.3% more uh, than was in the PB16 request. Or alternatively, if you view it relative to the budget caps, it'd be a 7.4% increase above the budget caps in FY22, just to get to that peak of the bow wave. Another way of looking at this, as I said before, we've got $97 billion in cumulative relief from the BCA budget caps so far, we would need another $130 billion in relief uh, between FY17 and FY21 when the budget caps come to an end. Uh, so the big question here is, you know, how do we get the relief from the budget caps to fund the modernization bow wave? And once we get to the end of the budget caps as currently set in law in FY21, what happens to the defense budget then? Uh, some would argue that the budget caps have been an anchor on defense, pulling the defense budget down over time. Another way of looking at it is the budget caps have actually been a floor on defense, uh, keeping it from falling even further than it might have otherwise. So once we get past the budget caps, it's a big unknown. Will it be uh, an anchor or a floor? 
All right, so alternative two is you could cut other things in the defense budget if you don't get a budget increase. Uh, you could cut more force structure. Here's some notional savings here. These are annual savings from cutting different types of force structure. Uh, you could do that to generate some of the savings required. Uh, I, saw, I showed this graph on the right-hand side. Uh, this is uh, R&D funding. Uh, over time uh, and looking at, well, where could you cut in R&D funding? Now, um, the, uh, the S&T funding, which is the gold line you see there, that's not associated with any particular program. Uh, it's been basically a, a pretty steady level of funding over time. Uh, you could cut into that, but of course you're cutting your seed corn. Uh, and the other point here is, well, there's not that much to cut. Um, so even cutting it by 10%, you know, what are you going to get? A billion dollars a year. That doesn't actually help you that much. Uh, what's not shown here are all the smaller acquisition programs I alluded to before. $96 billion in FY15 went to small acquisition programs, not the major programs, about 57% of the acquisition budget. You could cut those, but you have to keep in mind many of those small programs uh, actually support and enable the major acquisition programs that you're funding as well. Uh, so none of these would, would be without consequences. And of course, alternative three is you could rebalance among your major programs. Now, one of the things I found interesting when I uh, did this study uh, is looking at how much of the funding for major acquisitions is concentrated in just the top 10 programs. It turns out of the 120 uh, programs I looked at, major programs, 59% of the funding over the next 15 years is concentrated in these 10 programs, top 10 programs. So you could rebalance among these major programs. Uh, for the F-35, for example, if you cut the peak rate of production from 120 aircraft a year to 80 aircraft per year, that would save you about $4 billion annually. Ohio replacement program, if you slip that five years, uh, then at the peak time of the modernization bow wave, you would save between two and four and a half billion per year. It varies by year. Uh, LRSB, if you slip that by five years, uh, which you know the Air Force would be uh, very reluctant to do, seeing how they just awarded the contract, uh, and they're hoping to get out from protests soon. Uh, if you slip that, uh, that would save you between 2.3 and 3.6 billion a year during the peak of the bow wave. And of course, GBSD, the Minuteman missile replacement, if you slip that program by five years, you would save about an average of 2 billion per year at the peak of the modernization bow wave. Uh, so you could do some combination of these things to reduce the size of the peak, but again, this would not be without strategic consequences. Uh, one final point on this slide. I thought it was interesting that there are no Army programs here. There are no ground systems here uh, in the top 10 acquisition programs. Even assuming the Army gets their replacement programs that I showed you earlier, they don't uh, rise to the level of being in the top 10, not even JLTV. Uh, and all of the programs that you do see here, they are primarily intended for high-end conventional and nuclear threats. Uh, there are not programs here that are actually designed for low-end type threats that we're currently facing uh, in the Middle East and various other places around the world. Uh, so before I get off the stage here, there are already some changes we know coming in the PB-16 request. Uh, the Air Force uh, is reportedly going to be procuring another 75 Reapers uh, above what was in uh, the projections I've shown you here. And we also know there's going to be a slip in the LRSB funding, uh, not due to any kind of strategic choice, but just because of the delay in the contract award. Uh, the Navy uh, is also going to be cutting the LCS program pretty significantly, taking si uh, 12 ships out of that program. Uh, they will be maintaining the production of destroyers at two per year, and they're actually going to be accelerating uh, the Virginia payload module. They're also, interestingly, uh, going to be increasing the buy of the F-35 B and C models over the FIDEP. So we know some changes that are already coming. Uh, there are probably going to be many other uh, smaller changes that we will see once the budget request comes out. The final point I'll make uh, before I get off the stage here and we can get to our, our panel discussion uh, is that this, the modernization bow wave presents a really interesting opportunity for the new administration 
coming in a year from now. Uh, they're going to have some challenges to deal with, but also the opportunity here uh, is that in uh, trying to reshuffle programs to smooth out the modernization bow wave uh, and make it more executable, they've also got the chance to make sure those programs are in alignment uh, with their defense strategy. Uh, and that's what's really important here is to make, make sure that our major acquisition program funding uh, accurately reflects our strategic priorities. Uh, so it's really about you know, making sure that your budget aligns with your strategy, and so I think there's a real opportunity uh, for the next administration coming in to do that. Uh, so with that, I know I'm already over my time. Uh, I won't take questions now, but after we have our panel discussion, we're gonna open it up to Q&A from the audience, so please save your questions for then. All right, so with that, I'll ask all of my colleagues to come up to the stage. presentation so far and I think the questions people will have in particular on on uh, Todd's uh, where they haven't had an opportunity yet you'll you'll they'll they'll be fresh in their minds once we're <laughs> we're through our discussion here and then also introducing uh, my colleague Mark Kansian who's senior advisor in the um, international security program I'm Kathleen Hicks I direct the international security program here at CSIS and uh, we're very happy to see you as John Henry said happy to see those of you who made it through the snow delays to join us today and all those who are joining us uh, via the web. Uh, we wanted to take time today in particular to introduce our new series, Defense Outlook. Um, we're gonna talk this morning about uh, the first, one of the first products in that series, which is Defense Outlook 2016, which is an opportunity for us annually starting now to look a little backwards at the year that we just had and to look forward to the year that we are in and think about what the big trends are that are going to shape the defense space in that world. And it really is keying off the unique blend of expertise that we have here at CSIS from strategy to budget to forces to acquisition. Um, we hope all those things relate to each other and each year we're gonna test that proposition and see how well we think uh, the defense enterprise in the United States is doing at making sure that it's uh, aligning ends, ways, and means. There are further reports to come. Obviously, you, you heard um, Andrew's report will be part of the annual series. Um, two more coming at, but, uh, down the line. Uh, one is going to be an assessment of the defense budget that Todd will lead after we see the defense budget. And then Mark will lead an assessment of defense forces following that, looking really at the force structure and capability implications um, following on the strategy and budget. Every four years or so, or whenever DOD does a strategy, major strategy review, we will have beyond those annual assessments a, a quadrennial or, or whenever it comes out, strategic level review as well. So um, without further ado, what we would like to do this morning is walk you through this first 2015-2016 assessment and I'll kick off with strategy. As a strategist, I like to think strategy shapes things. My colleagues often remind me that doesn't always get to be the case, <laughs> but we'll pretend for this morning that strategy drives budget and, uh, and so forth rather than the other way around. Um, and I'm actually going to, uh, I'm not sure who has the... Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, Reese. Um, if you can skip ahead, actually, to just pause there. Uh, thank you for 2016. Well, that's that's the 2015 summary of what's occurred. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Thank you. Um, but what I would like to do is talk about 2016. I think everyone is aware of the major challenges that happened in 2015. So to keep this moving quickly, let me focus really on 2016. The challenges that we had in 2015 obviously were quite daunting, complex across the range from major state um, actor competition to um, uh, non-state threats with ISIS really taking center stage both in the Iraq-Syria theater and then globally beyond it, particularly uh, with the November Paris attacks really highlighting that. Um, there's no reason to think 2016 is going to be any less dynamic than 2015 was. The really, the key question for defense strategy is will enough shift in the environment to uh, call into question fundamentally the Defense Department's current strategic approach. It is the eighth year of an eight year administration. The chances of an actual formal strategy change review are extremely slim. Um, 
but that doesn't mean there won't be cause to change uh, major strategic approaches. So I think with a Secretary of Defense who hasn't been in that long, I think he will feel some degree of freedom to make changes. So I think we'll see how significant those will be. So most people in the strategy realm are going to be thinking ahead to 2017, to the presidential transition, and what the major strategy efforts will be in the new policies of a new administration. But that said, the world will keep moving through 2016. So I want to highlight some areas that we'll be watching. First is in the world events category. What are the big things that can happen on the world stage? I think it's fair to say, if you've ever been in any strategy discussion with defense people, we'll, we'll all start with the caveats, and this will be no exception. It is very dangerous to attempt to predict the uh, exact course of world affairs and how they will affect strategy. You, you will be proven wrong if you attempt to do so, but we're going to highlight some areas we know we'll continue to watch. First, as I said before, the uh, Syria-Iraq theater from ISIS to beyond ISIS issues uh, will be a significant area to watch. It didn't start well um, in 2015, uh, and it got progressively worse through the summer of 2015. Um, at, particularly as the train and equip program caused embarrassments for the administration, which it ultimately abandoned. Um, but by early 2016, you had the retake of Ramadi, or at least large portions of Ramadi. And now you have the prospect of a retake of Mosul. And I think watching for that uh, campaign, what, will Mosul be liberated? Will the grip that ISIS has on northern and western Iraq start to loosen? That will be very, a very important bellwether for how the coalition, the US-led coalition, is doing in its campaign against ISIS. Also to watch, of course, is the political issues inside Syria. The military campaign in Syria will be focused on devastating the leadership of ISIS, but also we of course have Russia there, we have the United States, we have Iran, um, you have uh, the Assad regime, and all eyes will be watching whether a political resolution is possible. We put the chances as not very high, but also note that the major incidents um, that happened, uh, ISIS-related incidents inside Europe, along with the overall migration crisis, is pressurizing European countries to think uh, uh, more seriously about trying to push political resolution inside Syria. There's also the global ISIS challenge. I mentioned Europe already. Um, for the United States also, this is a significant concern. There is evidence that ISIS has been trying to acquire a nuclear weapon. I think that's an area we'll be watching in 2016. Also, the flow of funds to ISIS um, from entities outside of its immediate territorial control and the social media outreach and other forms of outreach that um, ISIS has. These are things to watch. I think public-private partnerships, particularly on the social media side, are likely to increase. Uh, we are in a post-post uh, Edward Snowden stage, perhaps the beginning of that, and so you see a, a thawing of um, interest from folks who are in the commercial sector to work with government, uh, particularly post-San Bernardino, to be thinking about how we um, uh, best manage the t any tensions that might arise between privacy and security. Um, in the case of Iran, we had, of course, the major nuclear deal in 2015. 20, uh, to also in 2015, Iran then almost immediately began testing um, a ballistic, had, had a long-range ballistic missile test that wasn't in violation of the nuclear deal, but it was in violation of a 2010 UN Security Council resolution. So right off the bat, we have questions arising about Iran's intent, intentions. Um, and then, of course, uh, the State of the Union Day, everyone will recall, we had the case of the uh, U.S. Naval uh, service members who were captured by Iran, but then returned. Um, the United States has put in place economic sanctions on Iran for the ballistic missile test, but again, this is a space to watch. Will Iran's true intentions begin to show in 2016, and, and which way will they show if so? Um, not only in terms of it abiding by the terms of the nuclear deal, which I think is relatively safe to say, is probably secure for at least 2016. But what kind of investments will Iran be making in its other military and unconventional capabilities? Also watch for the U.S. to continue reassuring its Arab partners and Israel, and that might include new arms deals, that might include new kinds of access agreements and things of that sort. And uh, we'll be watching to see if the U.S. Shift its, shifts its posture, particularly its naval posture, in the um, uh, Arabian Gulf uh, as a sign of whether the United States has sort of a view that, that Iran is less of a threat than it has been. I don't anticipate that happening, but we will watch for it. 
With Russia, obviously, we have uh, long-term concerns about Russia's um, intentions with regard to Eastern Europe. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on Russian staff exercises. We'll be looking at military developments in terms of Russian investment. Uh, we don't put the chances of a Russian attack on NATO territory as high at all, uh, but we do think the risks are substantial enough that that's a space that you have to watch. What Iran is, excuse me, Russia is doing inside Syria, I think, is another question, and that I'll just you know refer to the space I've already spoken to. Watch that space for how Russia um, continues either to sort of is it going to have a strategic pause where it is, which is inside Syria, inside Ukraine. Um, and let those simmer a bit, or is it going to push further in those areas or elsewhere in 2016? In uh, the case of China, 2015 was really marked by the, the um, island building activity, which our own CSIS's Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative um, helped to create a lot of pressure around. Um, the U.S. administration became much more focused on it, particularly toward the end of the year, and did eventually have a freedom of um, uh, a naval uh, freedom of navigation operation around one of these contested spaces. So we'll be watching to see how much more of that happens in 2016. But also, uh, probably much less noticed, China in 2015 uh, under President Xi Jinping began a significant uh, uh, organizational reform that really in its totality could be looked at as the Chinese equivalent of a Goldwater Nichols Act. Um, that included placing the military PLA more firmly under a Communist Party civilian, if you will, authority. It included mandated headquarters efficiencies, reducing the size of the army, creating joint command entities. It sounds a little familiar. So we'll be watching in 2016 to see if the military effectiveness of the Chinese is materially affected by these changes, particularly as its economy starts to slow or has been slowing and there's more pressure on its um, defense budget if these efforts at efficiency do drive um, uh, better outcomes for the Chinese. And the last item to watch on the world stage really is the um, counterterrorism strategy in Afghanistan. And, and it certainly is not meant to be leased by being mentioned last. But we have had a very rocky road on the Afghan drawdown. The president's intentions to be totally uh, drawn out by 20, the end of 2017. He has changed that policy several times most recently with the decision to hold uh, at 9,800, the force level we have now, and to drop to about half that, about 5,500, um, after he leaves office. So that's very much subject to the next administration's uh, policy choices. But it, as I said, the world doesn't stop. We will be watching to see if the Taliban makes significant gains in 2016, if perhaps the U.S. pursues a strategy in Afghanistan as it has in Iraq, where it loosens the rules of engagement, maybe increase change, shifts around the posture of U.S. forces. I think this is an area that is likely to see some movement in 2016, whether for better or worse, we will see. Two other quick things I'll mention on the general topic of strategy. One is, of course, we'll be looking at the defense budget when it comes out in two weeks to see if it is uh, advancing and solidifying the department's own stated strategy. So we'll be looking at the rebalance to Asia and whether that seems to be supported by the budget. We'll be looking in particular at OCO for that Russian, you know, countering Russian aggression approaches. Are there no more pre-positioned stocks going into Europe? Are there shifts in posture, short-range um, um, uh, 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 anti-air um, uh, defense, excuse me, short-range air defense capabilities on items of that sort. And of course, the overall counterterrorism approach, again, largely in OCO, how much of that will be supported by the defense budget. And then the last area we really wanted to highlight is defense reform. There has been since uh, last year a strong interest on the part of Senator McCain, and in particular, the SASC has focused its hearing efforts on defense reform under the overall banner of Goldwater Nichols, but it's much broader. It's not exactly Goldwater Nichols, it's, it's, it's broader than that. Um, our own Defense 360 website, where the Defense Outlook work will hang, will also have a, a significant build out on defense reform. And uh, just today, uh, Dr. John Hamry, our CEO, has a commentary up there on this topic. And that will be the first in a series. CSIs will be watching defense reform very closely. Not only is there action in the Senate, there's efforts underway inside DOD. But these two things do not appear to be linked together. And the HASC is holding its, its powder dry at the moment. So these are the big questions to ask. Will the SASC press for reforms in this cycle? We think likely yes. 
What will those be? We have no idea. The hearings do not make that clear what the consensus, is, that, that there even is a consensus to drive toward change. What the HASC is thinking about is unclear. Whether department's efforts are going to yield something separate from, similar to, or nothing with regard to defense reform. Um, and whether the perception that's occurring on the Hill that DOD is, in, is against reform or has intransigence, whether that will spur reform efforts in the Senate or slow them down. So that's the, as quick as I could do, an overview of the strategic environment. And uh, let me turn now to Todd on the budget. All right, so 2015 was uh, a pretty interesting year for the defense budget. Uh, I'll just walk through quickly the timeline because that kind of tells the story. So this was only the second year, the FY16 budget request was only the second year uh, that the Obama administration actually submitted a budget request by the statutory deadline of the first Monday in February. Uh, and we now know that it will only be two out of eight because this year they have delayed it by eight days. Um, so. What happened, uh, this was also the first time that both chambers of Congress were in Republican control. What that meant is that Congress was able to pass a budget resolution. Now what's a budget resolution? It's not a budget, it's a resolution. Uh, it does not have the effect of law. It just is basically it's guidelines on the top level amount of funding for national defense and other parts of the budget uh, that are binding guidance on the other committees. Uh, so they were able to pass that budget resolution, uh, and it differed significantly from the president's budget request. The president requested $38 billion more than the budget caps would allow in the base defense budget in the PB16 request. In Congress, in their budget resolution, uh, they took that extra $38 billion the president requested, uh, and they just moved it to OCO funding. So the total amount was the same, but the way that they got to that, the president wanted to increase the budget caps, Congress just wanted to put it in OCO. That debate was really not about defense. That debate was really about the non-defense side of the budget. Uh, that is, is nothing new. Uh, and I think that that dynamic will continue. Uh, then we had a long stalemate and then a flurry of activity towards the end of the year. Uh, uh, in October, uh, the authorizing committees, the HASC and the SASC, uh, finally came out with their uh, conference version, their compromise bill for the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, they passed it in both chambers quickly and sent it to the president. Now, the NDAA is not an appropriations bill. It doesn't let you spend money, but it implies a certain level of money. And they wrote the NDAA to be compliant with the Congressional Budget Resolution, which means that it implied the use of OCO funding for base budget activities. The president had threatened to veto the bill over this. And then uh, in late October, he actually followed through. It was only his fifth veto of the administration. Uh, it's not unprecedented, but it is unusual to see the NDAA being vetoed, especially over something that the NDAA does not actually do. Uh, the NDAA does not actually set the level of funding, uh, and that was the uh, reason for the veto. But it turned out to be not all that consequential. Um, not long after that, uh, we came at the Congress came out with a surprise budget deal that had been working uh, in the background. Uh, it's now known as the uh, Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. Uh, that came out quickly and was signed into law. And what that did is it, again, increased the budget caps, this time for FY16 and FY17. Uh, so it was very much like the previous budget deal, the Ryan Murray or Murray Ryan, depending on which side of the aisle you sit on. Um, it, it was a two-year budget deal that increased the budget caps. Uh, and so what that means is not that sequestration is lifted. The threat of sequestration is still there because the budget caps are still there. So if you breach these higher budget caps, it will still trigger a sequester. It's highly unlikely that's going to happen. So if you hear anyone talking about sequestration this year, you can just you know, tell them you're crazy. That's not going to happen. We're not, Congress is not going to appropriate more than these budget caps. So we're not going to have a sequester uh, anytime in the foreseeable future. But that threat is still there if Congress did the stupid thing and appropriated more than the budget caps they just agreed to. What was different in this budget deal, though, uh, is that it actually explicitly included OCO funding as part of the deal for the first time. So it added an extra $8 billion in defense OCO, also an extra $8 billion in non-defense OCO that was going to the State Department, but an extra $8 billion in defense OCO funding for FY16, and then it set a floor on OCO funding at $59 billion for FY17. So it ended up being the same, it'll be the same level of OCO funding in both years. But it's just a floor on OCO funding in 2017. 
So what's interesting there is that Congress effectively did uh, what the president had opposed doing, uh, which is moving base budget funding into OCO, because that's what increasing the OCO funding effectively does. Uh, but that's what allowed the budget deal to get through. Uh, so the, you know, that's an interesting uh, question going forward, is what are we going to see? Are we going to see further changes in how OCO funding is used? Uh, and will it be used in future budget deals as well? Uh, of course, after the budget deal was reached, and quickly Congress modified the NDAA uh, accordingly to the deal. They passed it. It got signed into law at the end of uh, November, so only a month after it was vetoed, it actually ended up getting signed. And then December 18th, um, before we had to pass yet another set of continuing resolutions, they finally passed the FY, FY16 appropriations bills, which put an end to the budget debate for the year. Uh, but there's still a lot. Uh, to be debated over the next year. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what to look for in FY17, uh, we're probably not gonna see a lot of change in the top line level of defense spending because that has already been set by the budget deal. All uh, indications are that the administration is gonna stick to the levels of funding in the budget deal for FY17 in their budget request. Uh, there are some in Congress that are talking about going back and revisiting this debate to add more money for defense. Uh, I think that's going to be an uphill climb in Congress um, because they already reached a budget deal here. Uh, we may see Congress, though, add a little more in OCO funding beyond what the administration requests and beyond the floor that was established in the budget deal. But the big issues I'm going to be watching this year uh, are shown here, three big issues. The first one is how they use economic and efficiency assumptions in the budget. So in prior budget requests, uh, as the budget has been coming down, DOD has proposed a number of efficiency initiatives, and they have been banking these savings uh, and already spending them in other parts of the budget. Uh, and some of these savings have come true, and some haven't. Uh, and so when I look at the budget, I see a budget that is already highly leveraged on these efficiency savings. Now, one of the other things that you have to do with every budget is you have to make certain economic assumptions about what will inflation be in the future, uh, what will the price of oil be. Uh, you're trying to predict the future, and just like you know, in strategy, you can't predict the course of world events, it's pretty hard to pr predict the course of things like oil prices. If you could, you would make a lot of money. Uh, and so I, I don't think we're that smart. Uh, but you do have to make these assumptions one way or another in the budget. And as the economic conditions change, you, of course, need to update your economic assumptions. The price of oil has really fallen, I think, more than almost any of us would have expected. So, of course, they're going to reduce uh, the fuel budget uh, in this next budget request. Uh, and other economic assumptions will be adjusted as well. The question, though, is are they being overly aggressive in some of these assumptions? What if fuel prices don't stay at $30 a barrel? Uh, what if they come up significantly more than what DOD may be assuming in their budget? Well, then you're going to have a bill to pay uh, in the future. And so that's one thing I'll be looking for is, is are they making the budget even more highly leveraged on these economic and efficiency assumptions in the future? And if so, that's a big risk. The second thing I'll be looking for is this capability versus capacity debate, and then more broadly, the competition for resources in the budget among the services and between DOD and NNSA that I talked about before. Uh, the capability versus capacity debate really came to a head, I think, in the uh, memo from the SECDEF to the Secretary of the Navy uh, that, that came out back in December. Uh, and that really showed what the debate is about. For the Navy, at least, the debate is about uh, do we buy more ships, uh, lower cost ships like LCS, uh, and if we have to make trade-offs and we cut back on some of the more expensive platforms like destroyers, like Virginia, uh, payload module, other programs like that, um, or do you do what the Secretary of Defense has uh, ordered them to do, uh, is instead take risk on ship count buy fewer ships, but buy more highly capable ships in the future. Uh, so that, that is basically the capability versus capacity trade-off debate that's going on in the Navy. There's a similar debate going on in each of the services. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out in this budget request and what decisions they are making. Certainly from this uh, leaked memo, it appears that the SECDEF is pushing heavily uh, towards the capability side of the debate uh, at the expense of capacity. Um, and of course, then there's the competition for resources among the services. Do we see any significant change in the projected budget share of each of the services uh, compared to what was projected in last year's FIDEP? Last year's FIDEP showed that in the 
the five-year planning period, the Air Force was going to get a significant increase in funding, and that was coming at the expense of the Army, and the Navy was basically holding steady. So are we going to see any change to that in this budget request? Uh, the, uh, and then also I should note that the NNSA, National Nuclear Security Agency, uh, they are uh, part of Department of Energy, but their funding is under the same budget cap as DOD. So if weapons activities, nuclear weapons related activities in, in NSA uh, cost more, then that funding has to come out of DOD. So are we gonna see any uh, more shifts there between DOD and, and NSA? The final thing I'll be looking for is how they use OCO funding in the request. This is a different year because of the budget deal. It specified a floor of OCO funding of 59 billion. That is probably significantly more than the department would have otherwise requested in OCO funding in FY17. How much more? We'll never know because we never saw their OCO request for FY17. I would have imagined though that the OCO funding would have actually come down. Last year they requested 51 billion. I imagine it would have come down from that in FY17. Um, but now they're going to have to be at least at 59 billion if they're going to stick to this budget deal, maybe even more than that. The big question though is how do they use that money? What do they move into OCO that they hadn't already moved into? Now, both Congress and DOD have been playing a game here with OCO funding for a while, moving things that were kind of in the gray area of should it be war related or should it not. You know, ever since the BCA was enacted, they've been tending to opt towards moving things in there if they could at all be considered war related. Uh, I'll look to my colleague here, Mark Kanzian, because he was at OMB back at the last time the guidelines, the administration's own guidelines were set. Uh, in 2010 was the last revision of what could go into OCO. A lot has changed since 2010. Uh, we've now got operations going on in Syria. That wasn't part of uh, you know, anyone's thinking in 2010. Uh, we've got things going on in Europe with the European Reassurance Initiative, and we've got a very different budget environment here and pressure from Congress to move more things into the OCO request. So this could be a year for the administration to actually revise those uh, OMB guidelines for what goes into OCO. Uh, if I had to bet though, I bet that they punt on this one uh, and they just worm their way around uh, those guidelines for yet another year. And Congress, of course, is not bound by OMB guidelines at all. They can put whatever they want uh, into the OCO request as long as they get it appropriated. Uh, so those are the three big things I'll be looking for uh, when the budget request comes out. Mark? I think Mark is up next. Forces. forces. Great. Uh, on forces, we're, we're going to look at six things, six components. Of course, the four military services in the Department of Defense, active and reserve, but also civilians and contractors, because both of those are important parts uh, of DOD's force structure. Looking up here uh, on the left of what happened over the last year, you can see that Congress basically went along with the uh, president's and the department's proposals for uh, uh, personnel and for uh, forces. You can see they made one minor change to the efforts, but otherwise they uh, accepted what the department uh, had proposed. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that the Congress uh, uh, made no changes and went along with the uh, president's uh, budget in its entirety. And there are two big uh, elements that, uh, that the Congress raised that I want to talk about. The first one continues this discussion about capacity uh, versus capability. The Congress has been very concerned about the size of the forces, particularly the Army and the Navy. And as a result, they put some restrictions on what the uh, uh, department could do. On the Navy, as uh, uh, Todd uh, uh, alluded to, you know, the department has been inclined to uh, cut the number of ships, particularly cut some legacy ships, and then now uh, reduce the number of LCSs. Um, the Congress has pushed to keep some of those ships in operation. The, Na uh, the Navy, for example, had proposed uh, retiring uh, cruisers, the older uh, Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga, Ticonderoga class cruisers. The Congress balked and they came up with a strategy, which I've got up there, which is this is 246 uh, proposal where um, two ships would go in at uh, one time uh, for a maximum of four years, uh, no more than six ships, uh, limiting the number of ships that were uh, taken out of service. You also see that in the Air Force, where the Air Force had proposed 
to retire a lot of its legacy aircraft, the A-10s, of course, getting most attention there, but also F-15s, F-16s, uh, some bombers. Again, the Congress balked. They uh, pushed back on the A-10s and required that most of them be um, maintained uh, in service. Uh, they put some restrictions on other uh, aircraft. The Air Force, I think, will be able to retire some of those, but there'll be limitations there. The other big uh, um, uh, initiative or a big action that the Congress took was reducing the size of the overhead and the headquarters. And you can see up there this 25% cut to headquarters at the bottom of the DOD uh, wide there. A uh, lot of concern, I think, in the national security community, but particularly coming out of Senator McCain and the, and the SASC about the size of headquarters and overhead, wanting to put more resources into forces. So he has put this um, uh, cut, $10 billion over five years, including a 25% cut to headquarters. Uh, um, we'll see that, um, I think, play out particularly here in the Washington area because many of those headquarters are uh, here locally. Uh, it also relates to what Kath talked about, this Goldwater Nichols II, this uh, defense reform effort, because that will likely play into this, uh, although many of the proposals that are out there would, in fact, increase the size of headquarters or increase the number of headquarters, but the two will be, I think, moving along together. Uh, in terms of other things that are, are interesting up there, I note maybe uh, uh, two. I mean, one is the Army is uh, reorganizing as it gets smaller, it's, uh, reorganizing its brigades, adding a, a third maneuver battalion to its light and uh, armored uh, brigades. So the number of brigades is coming down uh, particularly uh, 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 steeply. Part of that reflects a, re a reorganization. The other one is this uh, National Sea-Based Deterrence Fund. The Congress keeps looking for ways to pay for the Ohio replacement uh, program. Um, Todd tells us now that that's really not uh, as much of a problem as people may have uh, uh, believed, uh, but it has been a belief in the community that this is a very, uh, this is a big bill that's coming to the Navy that's going to hurt their shipbuilding efforts and that therefore the Navy's gonna need some uh, help to pay for it. And they keep sort of signaling to the department that they want to do something. They created this fund with some transfer authorities that uh, I think are not really all that helpful to the Navy. Uh, I don't see uh, the department sort of picking up on that, but I think you'll see that uh, continuing. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Well, what are we looking at uh, in the coming year? Well, first, you, you see a pretty large drawdown in end strength as the services are all trying to get down to their long-term uh, levels. These are playing out the plans that were put in place a couple of years ago when the Budget Control Act was uh, put in force. And you'll see this continuing um, theme of capacity versus capability. People are very expensive so that there's a lot of pressure to cut people in order to put those resources into other areas, readiness and modernization particularly. Uh, this debate though about capacity and capability as Kath and, and uh, Todd alluded to also gets at questions about uh, what you want the armed forces to do. Uh, capacity would uh, uh, play more to uh, uh, like long-term stabilization operations. You also need a lot of capacity if you're going to be forward engaged extensively around uh, the globe. Capability, of course, is needed if you're going to have a conflict with a high-end opponent, such as uh, China or uh, Russia. So behind this, you know, this, this phrase is a debate about the future of the armed forces and what you want them to be prepared for. A couple of other things, I think, on the right that are sort of interesting. Um, Congress is likely to continue its concerns about the size of the armed forces. Uh, whether, you know, how that plays out in the coming year, uh, not clear because, of course, if you want the forces to be larger, you have to pay for that. May roll over to the following year. Uh, the uh, uh, Navy uh, may propose uh, retiring some of those cruisers again, getting back to this capacity versus capability uh, question. Looks like the Air Force has given up on trying to retire the A-10s for now. Uh, they haven't given up, they've signaled and they haven't given up permanently, but. You know, with the A-10s being used so much in the Middle East, it's, it's I think, hard to make an argument to retire them uh, now when they're being um, uh, used so extensively. Uh, 
And uh, the other, uh, uh, and the other thing I want to note is about uh, the shape of the forces, uh, force of the future. Back in, I believe, November, Secretary Carter put out a, uh, um, a series of reforms that he titled uh, Force of the Future. I think uh, they were uh, pretty well received. They had a lot of uh, you know, sort of sensible uh, initiatives in there. But it was disappointing compared to what the department had been signaling that it might, uh, that it might do. Uh, the department had signaled, for instance, that they were going to make some changes to the upper route system and military promotions. There was none of that in what they called tranche one of uh, Force of the Future. So we may see a, a tranche two of Force of the Future uh, coming out either with the budget or, or afterwards that uh, uh, changes more fundamental elements of the military uh, personnel system like the upper route um, uh, system. Uh, the other one is the Army. The uh, Commission on the Future of the Army reports out tomorrow. We are uh, blessed to have a member of the Commission with us. I think that's going to drive a lot of the. Uh, I think that's going to drive a lot of the debate about the army. Uh, the commission, as many of you know, was instituted to try to uh, calm the civil war in the army. Uh, the army, uh, the regulars, and the militia, of course, have been uh, uh, have had tensions since the beginning of the republic. So this is not exactly new, but periodically those tensions flare up, and we had another flare up. Uh, about a year ago, the um, uh, Congress created this commission to try to solve this civil war in the Army, and particularly this issue about uh, the, Ar the uh, aviation restructure initiative and what should happen to the attack helicopters. That reports out tomorrow. Uh, and I think that will drive a lot of the discussion about the structure of the Army and how it's composed and how the uh, active and reserve components uh, relate to each other. Great, thanks, Mark. And Andrew, you, you started us, and you get to that cleanup at the end. Alpha and Omega, OK. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Mark, I'm going to re uh, recommend Force of the Future 2.0. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's a really clever system. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on the outlook for 2016, since you've already heard me talk at some length about uh, 2015 and the years leading up to it. Uh, so if you can go, uh, Reese, to that slide. Uh, three key issues to watch in defense acquisition. There's really more than three, but maybe three themes. Um, uh, this, this predicted and optimistically perhaps predicted recovery in contract obligations for acquisition, how does it play out? How does it actually manifest itself? Uh, we know that 2016 will be a good year from an acquisition perspective, certainly in, in the investment accounts. And given the fact that services have proven so resilient, I suspect uh, they will also do relatively well. So for acquisition, 2016 should be uh, a pretty good year. Uh, 2017 may be more like a flat line. Uh, uh, in particular, the, the relief from the budget caps for 2017 was not as generous as for 2016. Uh, and it's anticipated that uh, a fair share of that, uh, uh, of where the department will go to make that budget cap work may come out of acquisition related accounts, but it should still, I believe, be a modest uptick. Uh, and then uh, one of the issues to watch will be this issue of how much of a share of the budget goes to acquisition. As I mentioned, uh, in the years leading up to 2015, that share fell uh, pretty significantly and uh, by about 10%. And does that uh, declining share of the defense budget, does it remain at that lower level? Does it return, perhaps, to where it was in the preceding years? My expectation is that it will remain a, de a smaller share uh, of uh, total defense obligations because of uh, the increasing expenses in health care, the uh, increasing expenses in the, in the personnel accounts, those dynamics will make it very difficult uh, for uh, acquisition contract spending to, to regain any uh, market share, if you will, uh, in the defense budget. Uh, the efforts to increase access to innovation. Uh, you're going to see continued efforts towards acquisition reform in the 2017 NDAA. That's been clearly signaled by both chairman and the House and Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, I believe, again, I mentioned this inflection point to turn from productivity as an emphasis towards innovation as an emphasis. I believe that the legislation you're going to see uh, in 2017 will be following along that new path and, again, focus on accelerating the adoption of new technologies, perhaps with some 
increased degrees of financial flexibility uh, and some additional work uh, to streamline and to create pathways in the acquisition system um, for innovative technology. And then let me talk a little bit about uh, what does this mean for industry and the structure of industry. Um, you know, the remarkable thing that happened at the tail end of, of my last presentation, 2014, the increase in small business. Um, potentially a very encouraging side, certainly something that policy and the department has been pursuing for some time. And there is a strong uh, a belief that uh, a lot of innovative technology is out there in small firms. And so that uptick uh, of small businesses uh, is a potentially encouraging sign. Uh, there's been a particular within that growth, particularly in electronics and communications, you know, where you might expect to see uh, innovative IT type technologies coming into the system. That's reflected in the increase in small businesses' share in electronics and communications spending. Um, my prediction is that that increase in small business uh, is <coughs> going to be difficult to sustain and, and very difficult to increase. Uh, when you start seeing small businesses getting 20% of the defense market, uh, to go higher than that, that market share has to come from elsewhere in the system. It has to come from the big primes. It has to come from the larger and medium firms. Uh, as Todd's bow wave presentation showed, uh, the big primes are likely to see a little bit more coming down the pike for them in terms of major weapon systems programs, which they almost exclusively control. So it's very hard to imagine small business going above the 20% share that they captured uh, in 2014. Uh, maybe marginally, but not uh, decisively. Uh, there should be some recovery for the big five. Uh, they, did, they did reasonably well over this time period, notwithstanding the defense drawdown. Uh, they did that for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, but the important ones are that they managed to increase their foreign military sales. They managed to aggressively cut costs within their operations in a way that the department uh, has maybe had less flexibility to do with, based on some of the limitations and restrictions that have been put on it. Uh, but industry has been pretty aggressive at laying, you know, at downsizing its workforce, uh, at consolidating its facilities, uh, and that is reflected in the fact that they've been able to keep their margins high. Um, and what is interesting is that there was a, a great degree of commonality across the big firms in industry and how they approached the drawdown. They, they cut costs, they did share buybacks, they increased dividends in order to keep, uh, in order to sh support share prices and to attract investors to their stocks. And the investors they were attracting were income investors who were looking for, uh, for those sorts of things. Uh, now, as I mentioned, with the inflection in 2015, there's a potential for growth. It could be slow growth. It could be slower growth. Um, but it's likely to be growth, uh, and it's likely to be slow. And the question is, uh, we're starting to see a, a diversity of strategies that companies take uh, to approach an era of growth. Uh, some may be trying to attract growth investors who are looking for not necessarily looking for share buybacks. They're looking for more investment and more opportunities to make big returns in the future. Uh, other companies may continue to uh, pursue a more income investor type approach. Uh, and then others you know, may continue to, sit, to look for uh, margins over revenues. So uh, there's a lot to look for in 2016. There can be a variety of strategies in industry uh, and it should be pretty interesting. Great, thanks very much, and uh, we want to open it up for questions now. There are microphones that can come around, so just raise your hand. Let's start right here. Hi, um, coming back to Todd's slides on you know where the where the bow wave is, um, isn't it likely I mean, that that the Air Force is going to have to make the biggest adjustments because? We can talk about, you know, we can, can in theory trade between the top 10 programs, but I don't really see the Navy being willing to give up its programs um, to cover the Air Force's bow wave. Um, and if so, that could have a, a, a pretty sharp, a serious effect on Air Force modernization out in the 2020s. Um, you know, do you see that happening? Do you think we'll start to see evidence of it this year? I mean, we've heard of um, ACC officers saying, um, look, we can't afford 80 F-35s a year, and acquisition community saying, we don't know anything about that. Um, <laughs> so do you think we'll see some evidence of this, or is, is this just being something pushed continually, continuously pushed over the five-year horizon? Uh, well, so in the Air Force's situation, um, 
if they were going to try to make trades within the Air Force budget, there are not a lot of other acquisition programs outside you know, the big three that we talked about earlier that they could make trades with. Uh, what they could do is cut capacity, cut force structure to make trades. And they've done some of that already. Uh, they could potentially do more of that, but I don't actually, I don't see it coming to a head uh, in this budget request. I don't see them making big changes like that. Um, if they don't have to. Uh, of course, the other alternative is the Air Force could just, just take a greater share of the budget from the other services. And like you said, well, the other services have their own internal issues. Um, so we may not see much of a shift in budget share either. Uh, so I actually, what I would expect uh, is that in this budget request, we're gonna continue to see the department plan for a modernization bow wave uh, and not do a whole lot to mitigate it just yet. That's why I think uh, you know, one of my takeaways from the report is this is really an opportunity for the next administration, uh, whoever that may be. Uh, they're the ones who need to be looking at these issues and starting to formulate a plan for what trade-offs are you going to make in the, the FY18 and beyond uh, budget request. Great. It's right back here. And please do give your name and affiliation. Yeah, my name is Herman. I'm activist for the Organizing for Action. Uh, maybe my question is not directly connected to the presentation of the panelists, but psychologically, maybe yes. Uh, about Iran, Iran as a threat to U.S. My, qu my question is, that do you have any hope in your minds when President Iran, Hassan Rouhani, met with Pope Francis yesterday in the Vatican, uh, urged Iran uh, not to fund terrorist activities. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. I, if I understood the question, it's is there any hope that Iran will stop its unconventional destabilizing activities? I, I think it would be a, a far-fetched hope. I, I, I maybe am also an optimist, so I have hope. But I, I think the bulk of the evidence is that Iran has long had destabilizing activities as part of its foreign policy, frankly, and it will continue to do so in the future. I think what we'll be watching is the, the trajectory. Is it going to ramp that up? Is it staying steady? Is is it, do we see evidence of it slowly decreasing sponsorship for some types of activities or some types of actors? Okay, another question. Oh, I'm sorry, we had one right up here. I knew I had one, I forgot. Thank you, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Uh, my question is for all of you. Uh, how pivotal will the FY17 budget be? It's really Ash Carter's first shot at this and uh, there seems to be a, a push for the third offset. So just, you know, in terms of the long-term implications, um, how significant is this? Thank you. Can we start on budget? Yeah, I mean, from a budget perspective, you're right. This is the first budget that Carter has seen through the entire process. Uh, so it's his first chance to put his stamp on the department's priorities in the future. It also happens to be his last chance because he will likely not be around for the FY18 budget request. That will be a, a new administration. Uh, how consequential will it be? Uh, remains to be seen, in my opinion. Uh, you know, the department gets to propose a budget. Congress sets the budget, though. Uh, so really the question is how much can they get Congress to go along with any changes that they're proposing in this budget request, and that remains to be seen. You want to weigh in on the innovation side, third offset side? Yeah, and you know, there's been, uh, I think actually Bob Work has said, expect 12 to $14 billion in uh, third offset related program spending in the FY17 budget. I think that may have been before the budget caps were fully set in place, so there may be some variability there, but it's, it'll be in the billions. Uh, and uh, I think the big question is, does that approach, does that sort of third offset focus on innovation, does that translate to the next administration? My prediction is that it will. I think there's a fair amount of consensus. I think you see agreement with, for example, Mac Thornberry uh, on the HASC that this is a priority, that this is an area of focus. Um, and in fact, he has indicated that he's not necessarily content with the FY17 cap and may, may seek to put additional funds in OCO. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of them were along these lines uh, towards this effort. So my guess is that that third offset will endure uh, beyond Carter, and that'll be part of a, a legacy uh, that, that is passed to the next administration. Of course, I'm, you know, in doing so, you have to discount the, the possibility of a Bernie Sanders or Rand Paul administration where that would, it probably would not translate in those situations. 
um, but, uh, but broadly uh, considered and among the most likely scenarios, uh, it probably will translate, I suspect, into the next administration. Yeah, I, I think if, if past is prologue, uh, you'll see the Congress go along with the end strength changes that the administration proposes, but continue, uh, uh, continue concerns about the size of the force and continuing to put restrictions on, on uh, retiring of the legacy systems. Later that. Yeah, go ahead, Pam. Oh, hold on, wait for the microphone, please. I think that Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we are, I had one queued up, I didn't know. So we'll, we'll go up here and then to you. Chick Feldmayer, NAMO. Well, you gave your overview of the environment. You discussed defense reform. Yeah. And rightfully so, uh, acquisition has gotten a lot of that publicity. Uh, but a new, another aspect of that that seems to be coming up is Congressman Thornberry's concern over the increasing role of the NSC. Do you see that going anywhere and becoming another element of defense reform? So interagency reform, if I can put it broadly under that category, has long been um, an area of concern for the defense authorizers, among others. Um, and they have funded in the past major studies in this area, the Project of National Security Reform, the Biongo Water Nickel series that was a CSIS series. And we are seeing once again, not just on the Hill, um, in the testimony of experts that were brought up through the Senate, a set of uh, roughly a dozen hearings, depending on what you count as part of the series, uh, we see plenty of evidence that retired uh, military officials and retired civilian defense officials feel very strongly that interagency reform is warranted. Um, that said, I think there's a lot of, because of the past is prologue, there, there is not a lot of hope that you can um, get enough statutory change in the system because of the way Congress is itself organized um, to make, take meaningful reform on the Hill side. So what you tend to see out of the authorizing committees, and you may see again this year, are changes that relate to strategy documentation, for instance. The national security strategy is, despite it being a White House requirement, is actually legislated in Title 10 as part of Goldwater Nichols, things like that. You might see some, some efforts that kind of come at the interagency reform issues from the DOD side, but it's frankly mostly outside the realm of those two committees to drive um, unless they take it on as a, an effort that crosses um, into other, working with other chairs and uh, uh, across other committees. That's where it stands. However, as uh, um, Andrew said on the last question, you do have a new administration coming in. I do think every administration comes in thinking about interagency reform. Um, and the, the question in my mind would be the staying power of any of the good intentions that come through that door. Um, so I think you would see very likely in 2017, we'll be talking about how you could, for instance, shrink the NSC staff. That's been a big topic of conversation, how you refocus the NSC staff on coordination and less on execution. Um, again, that was true in the last two administrations, uh, both the Bush two administration and the Obama administration, but you know, over eight years, you've seen accretion of power and, and, and uh, effort up into the center. So that's what I'd be watching for. Can I add something? Sure, I'm yeah, sorry. and then. To jump in in front of my colleague. Um, to, to reinforce some of the things that Kat said, um, I think you're gonna see indirect uh, efforts to maybe shape the interagency in the NSC, either through um, policies of a new administration or uh, uh, adjustments in the strategy formulation uh, process. I think the Congress has been historically very reluctant to make statutory uh, changes to the NSC because that's part of the executive office of the president. And uh, you know, they've, 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 they've hesitated to uh, uh, make direct statutory changes there, rather trying to you know, position the president in the administration. Uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, the, you know, what the NDAA, as has been mentioned, jurisdictionally doesn't, doesn't own the interagency. One of the problems in Congress is no one, actually, in Congress owns the interagency. Uh, and that's actually a major theme of Dr. Hamry's commentary, which is on the Defense 360 website. So I encourage you to take a look at that. His insights, as always, on this are, are, uh, are very important. 
Uh, but uh, one thing I would say is that Defense Authorization Act as a law that notwithstanding the occasional veto gets enacted every year is, is a vehicle for the potential for action. Uh, if Congress decides, if, if the various committees of Congress that do have some piece of the problem decide to get together and work together, the Defense Authorization Act is absolutely the logical vehicle where that could happen. So that at least creates that small chance, albeit I think not a, not a large likelihood of action in the next year necessarily. Okay, great, and final question. Karina Robinson, I'm an Army veteran, currently a Brookings Fellow on the Hill. And uh, Kath, I absolutely agree. Strategy should drive everything else, but it always doesn't happen. But in the discussion today, we talked about you know QDR, QDDR, OCO or non-OCO funding. You know, when when a certain budget uh, gets on the hill, and we're looking at how is it that we decide with the SFRC or the SASC where we can kind of cross-fund things to save money. Um, can you just expound on how that happens or should happen? Well, let, let me take one small sliver of it. I, that's, a, that's expansive, so I'll just pick one piece of it. it one area where in both the second uh, Bush II ad, uh, administration and the Obama administration have tried to progress in that space is particularly with regard to security cooperation funding and particular authorities. One common approach to sort of make all the committees on the Hill particularly comfortable as well as the executive branch is to have um, dual key authority systems where both the Secretary of State um, and the Secretary of Defense agree or have to agree before the, um, the appropriations can be used for that purpose. And again, this has largely been used in areas like counterterrorism funding. Um, building out capacity um, for counter-narcotics, training, things of that sort. So there are best practices, if you will, examples of um, the executive branch coming together to the Hill with separate authorizing committees and presenting a joint front, a united front, in a way that gives those committees their, um, it looks at the equities and the incentives of those committees to protect the funding that is for those agencies um, and give them assurance that that, they're, that, that will be protected. Mm -hmm. That's what's worked so far. I don't know if you have other thoughts from your HASC days. Uh, yeah, HASC and to some extent DOD yeah. days. I was, uh, where I was gonna go is uh, one of the last things I did before I left DOD in November of 2014 was uh, work through a process of the mechanisms that were created in, in largely in acquisition but also in security and cooperation to support the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the department saw those winding down, but it didn't want to give them up. And so we engaged in an exercise of, you know, what's the future of these mechanisms and authorities uh, uh, in a post-Afghanistan world, which we were anticipating at that time. Turns out Afghanistan didn't go away as much as we thought, but more significantly what happened is uh, ISIS arrived. The, the counter-ISIS campaign started. And so, uh, and also, uh, Russia and Ukraine happened. And so we started the conversation at a place where everyone in the room, albeit myself who was slugging away trying to fulfill the mission, was kind of skeptical about, you know, what are the chances of saving this? Congress will never let us keep them. Uh, you know, the, the system will reject them. There's no clear and compelling need. We suspected strongly, actually Dr. Carter and his time as deputy, that we would need these authorities again, and that's why we wanted to maintain them. Um, but again, what happened is the, the counter-ISIS campaign suddenly energized this. And OCO, the sudden availability of additional OCO funding for the European Reassurance Initiative um, over time, eventually for counter-ISIS type purposes, although initially that had to be taken from in Hyde, uh, that was really a game changer for getting pe suddenly getting people focused on, on these kinds of missions, which aren't purely DOD missions and which don't fit neatly in any particular service budget. And so OCO has been an indispensable tool uh, for making it possible to think about those things. And there's been elements of OCO that have gone to other than to agencies other than DUD for some of those activities. Uh, so it's been a real enabler. How long it will be sustained, as, as Todd said, is one of the big questions uh, to be answered in the 2017 budget. Uh, but again, given the fact that somewhat unexpectedly there is, uh, there is free play in the OCO budget, even more so than it automatically provides, it's an interesting opportunity for that. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for joining today. If, if we had three themes we'd have you walk out the door with, they, they're that you're unlikely to see major policy changes in many areas in the next year as eyes turn toward the presidential transition. But that said, Congress is still moving. Um, the, the world is still moving, and that may drive change in and of itself. And finally, uh, to, to Andrew's early point that the, uh, the recent budget agreement probably represents a little bit of a turnaround point for, for the defense budget in the way ahead. Um, hopefully it's a floor, as um, turning, turning the hopeful eyes to Todd, hopefully it's a floor and not a, not a cap. Um, I'm please to see any of the products that we talked about today, go to uh, uh, defense360.csis.org. And again, as we mentioned, Dr. Hamry has a commentary, the first in a series, an occasional series on defense reform. Um, and you'll see an, uh, another one come out in about three weeks. I think it'll address some of the issues that both of them will address some of the issues that have come up today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you for our next event. Thanks very much.